name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. Such a beautiful mother, and our hearts yearn, we truly yearn, that everyone in the world, all the Protestants indeed, all the Muslims, the Hindus, the beautiful Buddhist people, even the beautiful atheists. Some atheists are very beautiful. They just don't know God yet. We pray that all the peoples of the world will, will know God's masterpiece. Her name is Mary. She is God's Mona Lisa. She is God's masterpiece. She is really the emblem of the human race. We pray that one day, soon, 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 every human being on the face of the earth will know the Virgin Mary, will enter her heart, and become humble and spotless and beautiful like Mary, waiting for God. And it, it also reaffirms that message that it's humility that leads to joy. That when our eyes are focused on God, then we are focused on the most beautiful being in the universe. Mm -hmm. We're not focused on something broken or, or something sinful, God forbid, but we're, fo we're focused on something perfect and absolutely beautiful, to look at the beautiful one all day and all night, and then to live in his will. I mean, then, then we're consumed by beauty, you see? And that's why one writer said that in the end, the world will be saved by beauty, he said. In the end, this world will be saved by beauty. We were actually, we were made to be beautiful. Of course we were. God is not just beautiful. God is beauty in itself. You might say that Mary is created beauty, and God is uncreated beauty. But we were made by the beautiful one. We were made to be beautiful. And so when we fulfill this destiny of ours to know beauty and to live in a beautiful manner, we, we can't help but be joyful. We can't not be joyful when we live face to face with beauty. And when our actions are morally pure, uh, we are participating in beauty, not just looking at it, not just admiring it, but when we are morally pure, we are participating in beauty. We are becoming beauty. And so, yes, this is, it really fulfills that. It, it exemplifies that virtue and the fruitfulness of humility. Humility always yields joy. And, you know, Maximilian, he was quite a first-rate theologian. And in fact, Mother Teresa, I think, is one of several who have petitioned the Vatican to name him a doctor of the church, a doctor of the church. He was a first-rate theologian, a theologian for the ages. Um, much of his um, adult life as a theologian was consumed with one sentence, and he penetrated this with the light of his intellect, you see. Our intellects, Thomas tells us, St. Thomas, have a natural light to them. And when we receive confirmation in the various sacraments, there's a supernatural light, too, within our intellects. And so this beautiful St. Maximilian, with the light of his intellect and supernatural light, tried to, to unfathom, you might say, that line of the Virgin Mary that she spoke to St. Bernadette Subaru at Lourdes in France where Mary said to St. Bernadette, when she asked her, she asked the queen, who was she? She says, I am the Immaculate Conception. Mm -hmm. These are very mysterious words. And, of course, little Bernadette was just a teenager at the time. She had never even heard those words, not even in French. What do you mean, the Immaculate Conception? It had just been declared a dogma just a few years previous to that moment. But here's what really struck Maximilian and other wonderful theologians as well. Mary did not say to Bernadette, I am the one who was conceived without sin, or 
I, I am the one who was immaculately conceived. But rather, she said, I am the immaculate conception. And that's what struck Maximilian and all the great theologians. Mary said, I am the immaculate conception, not I am the immaculate conceived. And he pondered that for years. What does that mean? And in fact, when he was arrested by the Nazi soldiers and brought to the concentration camp where he would ultimately die, and I've, I've been to that concentration camp and prayed right there at his cell where he, was, where he died. That very week, he was working on this sentence. When they arrested him, the papers were on his desk, his musings about this. And there's a beautiful book that's been printed and published uh, about his musings and his theological work on that very line. A beautiful book has been printed and is available now about the Immaculate Conception by Maximilian Kolbe. He's how in the world can Mama say, I am the Immaculate Conception? Only God normally can say, I am. As he said to one of the saints, I am he who is, and you are she who is not. <laughs> the Lord could be firm when he needed to be. He spoke that to one of the saints. I am he who is, you are she who is not. See, and that, that's humility on our part. But Mary was able to say, I am the Immaculate Conception. And so Maximilian would ponder, who are you, Immaculate Conception? Who are you? What do you mean you are the Immaculate Conception, not just Immaculately Conceived? And in his deep thought and prayer, with the light of the Holy Spirit, he came to these several conclusions. And it's really, it's amazingly, it's striking beyond words. He came to the conclusion that the very phrase, the Immaculate Conception, is that is actually a theological phrase for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Immaculate Conception. So he made the distinction. The Holy Spirit was conceived, you might say, from the love of the Father and the Son, and conceived spotless. He is the original Immaculate Conception. And so St. Maximilian said that the Holy Spirit is the uncreated Immaculate Conception. And Mary is his mirror image, the perfect image of the Holy Spirit, the bride of the Holy Spirit. She assumed his name, marrying him, and she is the created Immaculate Conception. The Holy Spirit is the uncreated Immaculate Conception, and Mary is the created Immaculate Conception. And those were the conclusions of St. Maximilian, trying to unpack the mystery of those amazing words. When Mary could actually say that, using the be verb, I am the Immaculate Conception. So that Mary is a singular gift in the history of humanity, a singular gift. And the way that I unpack it is very much related to Maximilian. And it goes like this, that a conception is a thought. I conceive the idea of this university or I conceive the idea of this show. We, we speak of conception, especially in philosophy, as a, as a thought, that we conceive a thought. And so Mary, you might say, is, is a conception. She's a thought of God. But she's the immaculate thought of God, the immaculate conception. That means she's the spotless thought. But as we said earlier, that means she's the beautiful thought of God. Mary is the, the beautiful thought. That is the thought of the Holy Trinity. I want someone like this. This will be the mother of my son. This will be the bride of my son. This will be the model of the church. This is my immaculate thought. This is my beautiful conception. Mary, that's what everything is leading towards. God made us to be like Mary, his beautiful thought, and his son died on the cross to restore that beauty to us. And so Mary, the Immaculate Conception, I, I just sort of grew on what St. Maximilian himself wrote, that Mary is the beautiful conception, the beautiful thought of God for all the creation. The whole world was made for us, but we were made for God. We were made for God not to be ugly and sinful. We were made to be the beautiful, spotless bride of his son. 
We see that perfectly incarnated in the Virgin Mary. And so Mary is, you might say, the singular thought, the singular thought of God. And we see that in Our Lady of Guadalupe, this amazing image of Our Lady in Mexico to St. Juan Diego, which actually occurred about this time in Mexico in those years. That was actually the octave of the Immaculate Conception. The reason I bring that up is that not only did Our Lady appear to Juan Diego during the octave of the Immaculate Conception, but that image of Mary on Juan Diego's tilma, which is still preserved today miraculously, more than 400 years later, that image is still there, and many theologians think this is the, the original thought of God, that God painted that image on Juan Diego's tilma on the feast of the Immaculate Conception. He painted it. That's his painting of his mother. That's the beautiful thought of God, is Mary. And she's the one, you might say, that all women are modeled after her. The saints say when God created every other woman in the world, he first thought of his mother, and he made you to look like her. So she's like the blueprint, the blueprint for the human race. That's why she wears blue so often in her dresses. She's the blueprint of the human race. And so from St. Maxime and Colby, we learn that this designation of Mary as the Immaculate Conception, one conceived without sin, is something more. She is the primary, the beautiful plan and thought of God for the human race. And he had to keep her spotless, not only for his son, but to be for us the mirror of sanctity. She's the mirror for all of us. What Mary was, so we shall become beautiful in moral purity and rejoicing forever in the praise of God. Mary is the Immaculate Conception. She is the thought of God. She is, Mary is the plan. On the feast day of the Immaculate Conception, we honor Mary also under the title of the Mystical Rose. And that comes from some approved apparitions of our Holy Mother um, to a, a beautiful holy nun in Italy back in the 1940s. Her name was Sister Pierina, and he appeared to her in a little tiny church in a place called Montichiari, Italy, Montichiari. And Our Lady came to, to Sister Pierina at least 11 times and had special messages for her and eventually asked Sister that she would begin to promulgate, to proclaim to that little village and to the, eventually to the whole world that Our Lady wanted all of us on this day, her feast day, December the 8th, at 12 noon, to pray for an hour in her honor. It's really quite a beautiful devotion. So it comes around once a year on this day at 12 noon, and it wasn't, it wasn't very strict requirements, but it's really striking, though. It stands out what Our Lady did ask her. And she said you could go to the local church, but you could also pray at home for this hour. But if you're at home, you could put away all distractions, you know, television sets and phones and all distractions. So it's an hour of silence. And Our Lady said, she told Sister Pierina, to begin the hour of grace. She called it the hour of grace. To begin it by praying those Psalm 51. Our Lady asked us that we pray it three times, that psalm, the 51st psalm, with our arms outstretched. Isn't that interesting? Like mm -hmm. Jesus on the cross. So Our Lady's special request was during that hour of silent prayer, the hour of grace, to begin it by praying with our arms outstretched and praying Psalm 51 three times. Most of us kneel during that time, but some may not be able to kneel. But to stand, to kneel, or to sit, but to hold our arms outstretched and pray the psalm three times. And then Our Lady said the rest of the hour of grace can be spent on any special prayer that enables you and I to have communion with God. So it could be certainly the rosary, or just meditating on the Eucharist. Um, whatever our favorite prayers or hymns are for the rest of that hour. What's very interesting, though, is that Our Lady asked this of all of us so as to make up for, to do penance for the world. 
especially for the sins of sexual immorality. So this holy hour is meant for you and I to do penance for the, for the church and for the rest of the world, that God would forgive and cleanse all the sins of sexual immorality, of impurity. You remember Our Lady told the children at Fatima that more souls go to hell because of the sins of the flesh than for any other reason. So here's another approved apparition shortly after Fatima where we're giving an opportunity here to do something about it, to stop that headlong plunge into hell of so many souls. We live, team, in a perilous time. And why do I say that? Well, you know, it's the media in particular, but you know, our culture today, our, our televisions and, and our iPhones and iPads and the movies and the magazines, the, the immodesty of or the way that so many people dress is all leading us into and promoting sexual immorality. So much so that we've forgotten how serious it is that these kinds of sins are mortal sins. They disfigure the soul. If Mary is immaculate, how immaculate is God? That's why there's an ancient phrase in the church, holy things for the holy, holy things for the holy. We have to be holy because we serve the Holy One and we love Him. This particular hour of grace, every year, there's no reason why you couldn't do it other times of the year as well, is meant for you and I to make up for the sins of the flesh. Perhaps our own if we have them, but maybe for our families and for our, our village, our city, our country to make up for the sins of the flesh, to do penance for others in particular, so they won't be lost forever. So it's very fitting, it's very apropos, that this request and this particular um, penance would come on this day, the day of Mary's spotlessness, beauty of holiness. Mary is giving us a way to help um, rid the earth of the ugliness of sin with the beauty of holiness. I really love this about our faith, about our Jesus, and about our Mary. They don't just tell us good things and holy things, but they also show us how to accomplish it. They don't just talk about these beautiful high ideals, which, of course, we have to, but they always give us childlike ways to bring it about, to bring about what they're talking about. And so that's what this is all about today, this special um, feast day, the Immaculate Conception, this special um, apparition of the mystical rose is about restoring the purity that Mary had in perfection, restoring that to our families and to the human race on this particular day. This is a day of grace. Mm -hmm. I can feel it here in my rectory. Mm -hmm. This is a day of grace. And the 12 o'clock hour is an hour of grace. And Our Lady did say this is remarkable. She made at least three promises. Our Lady said that many special graces would be granted on, on this day during this holy hour, many special graces. And I would tell our listeners, you know, don't lose heart if you didn't know this or you forgot it. You know, the God that I know is pretty nice. <laughs> and so I would say do it anyway. If you, if you didn't know to do it at 12, I think it's 251 here in Georgia. So do it at 3. Start it. Start your own holy hour at 3, because guess what? It's 12 o'clock somewhere. So join <laughs> yourself, so wherever it's 12 o'clock, join yourself in the Spirit with them and do it anyway. An hour of quiet prayer, beginning with Psalm 51 three times in a row. The rest of the time, quiet, better on your knees if you can, and offered as a penance for all the sins of immorality. Our Lady promised that many special graces would be granted on, during this hour, she also said that the most hard-hearted sinner would be touched by the grace of God. The most hard-hearted sinner. So if we ourselves are having trouble with hard-heartedness, we can do it for ourselves or for someone that we know. And thirdly, Our Lady actually said that whatever we ask Our Lady for during this hour of grace, even if it's impossible, will be granted to us. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't contradict the will of God in any way. Even if it's impossible, whatever we ask will be granted. Many souls have experienced this from this devotion. 
And so extraordinary favors are being given to us this day. And we probably need them this year more than ever. We need this grace of purity and, and this gift of receiving whatever we ask for in these impossible times. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm going to begin, uh, beloved, with just a little tiny poem, a poem to in honor of Our Lady. Mary, crowned with living light, temple of the Lord, place of peace and holiness, shelter of the Word, mystery of sinless life in our fallen race, free from shadow you reflect, plenitude of grace, virgin mother of our God, Lift us when we fall, who were named upon the cross, mother of us all. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, heaven sings your praise. Mary magnifies your name through eternal days. We ask you, Lord Jesus, Father God and Holy Spirit, that through the prayers of Mary, under the title of the Immaculate Conception, the patroness of these United States of America, this land so blessed and so chosen by God, never meant for sin, but meant for holiness. We pray you today, O Lord, we would return to honesty, humility, and purity in this land, as modeled by the Virgin Mother of God, the Immaculate Conception. May the United States of America be restored to the beauty of holiness. May we be a shining light and a beacon to the entire world and to all the other nations, showing them the way to heaven, with Mary pointing out to the world the name and the person of Jesus Christ. O Virgin Mary, pray for every citizen of this country. Pray for all who live here that we will love God with your love and reflect him with your very light. May he bless his beloved country and one day very, very soon make us victorious in holiness and truth and love and in the gospel message. May Almighty God bless everyone listening through Mary's intercession. May you all become spotless and beautiful to the glory of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 